today's message, as you saw when you came in, after the plague. Now, there is no doubt that our nation and the world has been ravaged by a plague. Doesn't matter where it started. We know it started in China. Doesn't matter that they covered it up and hid it. We know that. It has ravaged the world. That's the problem. The problem is what do we do with it? How do we deal with it? What happens after the plague? Because the plague is going to burn itself out. It may be with us forever, but we're going to de develop immunity to it. That, that's what happens. But what, ab what about the economies of the world? What about the people of the world? What about the church? And that's what's most important, the church, after the plague. So, Exodus chapter 13, verse 17, we're going to look at what happened after the ten plagues in Egypt. It came to pass, when Pharaoh had let the people go, that God led them, not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was close. Now, you know, if Egypt is here, this is the Mediterranean Sea, Egypt is here, Israel is here, the Philistines were here. The shortest route to Israel from Egypt would have been along the seacoast, especially because Israel lived in the north of the land, area called Goshen, which is the Nile Delta. That's where they lived. So they could have just gone right up the coast, and that would have been the shortest, most direct. However, the Philistines were there. The Lord did not want to take them through the Philistines. The Philistines, as you know, we, I've taught before, the Philistines were descendants of the ancient Bronze Age Greeks. Warring people. We hear about Troy and um, the Trojan War, the Iliad, the Odyssey. They were, they were descendants of those people. They were warlike. They probably, even though it was a, several hundred years later, they probably... Uh, maintained their warlike methods and their army and tactics. The one clue we have to that was that one of the things, if you've ever read the Iliad, or I don't know, I think there's a movie out, Troy something or other, I didn't go see it, but uh, those are all, all those Hollywood movies about ancient classics, they all stink, I'll just let you know, unless they're made in the 50s. Things made in the 50s are fabulous. Um, across the board, I mean, made in the 50s, Fabulous. Anyway, um, the modern ones, they, they got all this computer-generated stuff, and they do things like, I think I saw a clip of uh, Achilles in the Trojan War leaping up in the air and turning. And, okay, they didn't do ballet, okay, on the, on the battlefield. They were trying to kill each other. So, anyway, what they did do, and I, the movie may have pointed this out, what they did do, is rather than all the armies, the both armies clash right away, they didn't do it that way. They had a champion come out. Achilles was the champion for Greece. So the champion would come out. And then the other side would have a champion. Hector, who fought Achilles in the original Trojan War, he was the, the older son, eldest son of the king of Troy. So he was the champion for Troy. So they would come out and fight. And uh, whoever won that won the whole thing. I think my phone is found. Where was it? In the men's room? Where, where, where was it? On the floor. All right. Who tried to steal it from me? I left it on the floor. I didn't realize. Yes, I have a missed call from Vika. I have an, a voicemail from Anatoly. I have another missed call from Vika. Thank you for trying to locate it. I'm just going to take a pause here, and I'm going to um, send in my tithe, okay? I already have There it goes. All right. Now I feel better. So, uh, the same thing we see in the Bible when David, as a young boy, is fighting against the Philistines. And who is standing there but Goliath, and what is he saying? Send out your champion. So it's the same technique that goes back to ancient Troy several hundred years before. So very, very, it's about 300 years before. So anyway, here, God does not want to take him through there because... They're really no champions yet. They've been slaves. They, they don't have any fighting people yet. And it came to pass when the Pharaoh had let the people go, God led them. That's the key. God led. God led. After this plague, we must depend on the leading of God as never before. Not our own ideas and concepts. Not the way we've done it. Look, the world's going to be different. Everything's changing. Can you believe uh, major sports not happening yet? 
and they're arguing about when it is going to happen and how it's going to happen and if it's going to happen with no stand, no, no people in the stands. But as far as I'm concerned, they're squabbling about political things, so I don't care if it ever happens again until they get themselves straight and know that they just are there to play a sport. They're not there to make any kind of political comments, right? They're just there to play a sport. That's all we want out of them. Same thing with Hollywood, right? They're not make, or maybe they're starting to make movies again in Hollywood. But uh, I, I heard some things like the Ivy League schools are canceling all their fall sports. They're not going to have Ivy League football. Well, who cares about Ivy League football? They were never any good anyway, were they? I mean, was Ivy League football really high on the leaderboard? Ivy League football, yeah, Harvard. Oh, yeah, let's go watch Harvard play. They stink at football. Uh, then the big, big schools are going to play conference only. That's what they're talking about. At least they're talking about playing. You know, that's good. But everything's going to be different. Schools. We don't know if schools are going to be open. Here in South Carolina, they're saying schools may be open in September instead of August when they open. And then who knows if that's going to happen. Other places, they don't know if they're going to open at all. So things are changing. Everything's going to be different. Uh, I think uh, there are a lot. That means there's a lot of opportunities for new positions, new jobs, new ideas. Most of it's going to be online. The Lord will give you, you know, do you remember back in March, and I, I threw out, do you remember that, that service when I threw out all these, you weren't here. That's right, you weren't here, but you're online. I threw out all these ideas and names for new businesses. Do you remember that? Remember when I, I did that? Well, there's a bunch of people locally in South Carolina, probably in D.C. too, but I hear them advertising, uh, a detailing company advertising, making your car COVID-free. That's what I was talking about back there, a detailing, car detailing. Uh, to make sure it's disinfected, your car's disinfected. Um, and then all the different ones. Uh, there are several of the, the uh, cleaning companies that are specializing now in COVID cleaning. Uh, that's what we were talking about. So people are adapting. We want to be led by God. Let him show us how to adapt. Use every bit of intellect, but depend on the spirit of God. Because here, the intellect would have been, hmm, we're in Egypt, we're going to Israel, let's head up the coast. No, that's not what the Lord had. The Lord had another thing in mind. So, he says, uh, and God said, lest the people repent when they see war and return to Egypt. He didn't want them turning back. But God led the people through the way of the wilderness by the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up, harnessed out of the land of Egypt. And Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. For he had straightly sworn to the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and you will carry up my bones with you. And they took their journey from Sukkot and encamped at Etam in the wilderness, in the edge of the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go both by day and by night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. So, number one. Number one, after the plague comes the purpose. The purpose. We may not know the purpose of the plague. There may have been nefarious political reasons for the plague, where it started in China. We may not ever know that. People will surmise, people have ideas, people have thoughts, but there is the purpose of God after the plague. The purpose of God here, number one, freedom. Don't you know the Lord wants us to be free from the influence of the world? Before the plague, we were all probably much more, much more influenced. I certainly hope you're not all watching a lot of TV. I'm talking about broadcast or cable. I certainly hope we're not watching a lot of TV. We need to be free of that. We need to be free of that influence. I'm not talking about the entertainment, but the influence. Not only the influence of commentators but the influence of advertisers we need to be free of that we are to be free of the things of the world that we're not holding on that we're not joining in boycotts and things because somebody said something that's crazy stuff we need to be free of all of that that we can be led by God led by the Spirit of God not led by fashion not led by commentary, not led by opinion, not led by uh, the, the kinds of things that pass through the natural or Christian world that everybody jumps on the bandwagon, led by God. Individuals together, led by God. Not following one another, 
following him together. There's a big difference. We're not here to follow other people. We're here to follow Jesus together. So that we are following together, but following him, not each other. Number two, personal guidance. We see right there, after the plague, there's much more intense personal guidance. Much more intense. We are going... We are no longer going to count on the things we used to count on to make decisions for us. We are going to depend on the personal guidance of God to make our decisions. To make our decisions about ourselves and our family. To make our decisions about the church and focus and vision. Following God. He, by the Spirit, will show us, this is the way I want you to walk. He didn't let him go the easy, fastest route. And it wasn't easy, really. It looked easy because it was close, but they didn't know what would, would await him there. He wants us to follow him closely. It may be a little bit more difficult and circuitous, but it will pay off. There are things that we can do that we don't necessarily want to do, but that we find ourselves doing. And we might wish that there was an easier way, but don't you know you get stronger through those more difficult ways? You become more flexible, more able, and more dependent. God wants us more dependent on him, not less. More dependent on the Spirit of God, not less. The third, relationship. After the plague, there was a much closer relationship between the people of God and the God of his people. He is the God of people, not just a nefarious God somewhere out there doing his own thing. He is the God of people. We are his people. It is up to us to bridge the gap through Jesus and be much closer to him than ever before. After the plague, they saw his mighty hand. They saw his protection upon his people. We are a protected class. We are a protected people. We are under the hand, under the cloud of God. We have the blood on the lintels and doorposts of our hearts that the death angel must pass over, that the plague cannot come near us. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to go out and do anything stupid. We're not going to go to a coronavirus party. We're going to wear masks. By the way, can I joke with you, Dr. Al, today? Dr. Al, you know, usually sits up here. In the last several services, he's sitting back there. And I figured it's because when I get exuberant, there's, there's some spray, you know. And the aerosol, right, the aerosol can, can, can contain the virus. But just think of it like this. It's not aerosol. It's holy water. It's holy water. The Lord gave that to me just today when I was sitting here just for you. It's holy water. And... Yeah, 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 there was a, a Catholic priest who was um, putting holy water on people with a squirt gun about, I think it was back in March, sometime he was squirt, squirt gun. Don't get any ideas, okay? No squirt guns in the church. No squirt guns in the church, all right? No ideas. Yeah, you, the reason I know it's holy water is because, you know, I don't perspire. You know that. I'm anointed. I don't perspire. It's just anointing. It's just the anointing just coming out. Uh, I'll look at the comments later. And keep in mind, I copy all the comments. So watch what you say. I keep them all. I have a whole book full of all, all your comments. I may release them one day. All right, so purpose. Relationship. God wants a stronger relationship with us. If you've been through something, something that's a breakdown, something that's been difficult, something that's been emotionally strenuous, haven't you drawn closer to God because of it? Didn't that bring you closer and you sought God? Or in the midst of it, you began to seek him like never before? Even whether it's a financial crisis or a relationship crisis or a physical crisis of sickness or disease, you seek God more. Well, he wants to have that relationship during the good times. When everything's good, he wants to have that closeness and us seeking him on a daily, regular basis. So number one, after the plague, there is purpose. We must find our 
purpose in God at this moment in time after the plague. Now the plague, it's on its way out. You might say, but the numbers are getting high. It's on its way out. It's given its last gasp. It's on its way out. I see it by the Spirit. Doesn't mean to stop wearing your mask. Doesn't mean to be shaking hands. Keep using your hand sanitizer. All that stuff. We are going to overcome it as a nation and as a world. We're going to be able to live with it. But I see it passing away. Just like the plagues of Egypt had a moment in time and passed away. And that's what we're looking at today. After the plague. Purpose. Our purpose. Our purpose as individuals. Our purpose as families. Our purpose as the church. Number two. Exodus 16. Go to Exodus 16 with me. Verse 1. They took their journey from Elam, or Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came into the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after the departing out of the land of Egypt. So this has been gone two months. And the whole congregation of, of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. They wanted to die one of those plagues. Imagine that. Because we sat by the flesh pots. Doesn't the King James have a way with words? Flesh pots. When was the last time you sat by a flesh pot? Now, you know, that conjures up all kinds of thoughts in my mind, a flesh pot. And I'm not just talking about pots and pans on the stove, you know. I mean, and we did eat bread to the full. For you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill us all with hunger. So they missed a meal and they got a little cranky. Bottom line, right? And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my way or not. It shall come to pass that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in. It shall be twice as much as any other day. <clears throat> so, what is God doing here? Provision. It's one of the points Pastor Mary Beth made. Provision. Provision. The Lord provided every single day for 40 years. Every day for 40 years. The Sabbath, He didn't provide that day. He provided it the day before. Twice as much the day before. God keeps his calendar. He knows what's day of the week it is. He knows what's going on in our lives. He provided every single day for 40 years. Bread from heaven. God provides for his people. God provides for his people. But let's say, just surmise, there's nothing in the Bible, but let's just surmise that there was a group of people who said, you know what? I'm not sure Moses really knows the way to the promised land. I know it better. Come with me. And they leave the group and go their own way, kind of like some people on our Israel trips. Go their own way. Right, Renee? I'm not saying you did, but others did. You know what I'm talking about. And uh, do you think they would have had any manna? I don't think so. The manna fell around the camp. God ordained their camping places because the pillar of fire or, or the pillar of smoke or pillar of fire stopped when they were to camp. So he determined where they were to camp. He determined their resting places. So the manna fell there, not some other part of the desert. He provided every day for those called according to his purpose. The people of purpose are the people of provision. The people of purpose are the people of provision. We can trust and believe God to have something when there's nothing as long as we're in the purpose of God. Provision. What about chapter 17? You don't have to turn. Chapter 17, they're, they need water. They're dying of thirst. They need water. So he makes water come out of a rock. Water out of a rock. And he does that a couple of times. Another place, the water's bitter, and he has it turn sweet. 
throw this, this tree in there. It turns sweet. So each and every time, God provides what they need. Notice that when they got to a place, they needed water. Mountain Dew didn't come out. Gatorade didn't come out. Coca-Cola didn't come out. What came out? Water. It's what they need, not what they want. What they need. Now, he does give us the desires of our hearts, but our hearts' desires should be in line with his will for us. So, everything they needed, God provided. Everything we need. Isn't there a song? It's a hymn of the church. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Provision. So it's purpose, provision. And number three, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 9. Deuteronomy chapter 9. In Deuteronomy chapter 9, we'll start in verse 1. Hear, O Israel, you are to pass over Jordan this day to go in to possess nations greater and mightier than you, cities great with walls up to heaven, a people great and tall, the children of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you have heard. Who can you say, who can stand before the children of Anak? Understand, therefore, this day, that the Lord your God is he which goes over before you. As a consuming fire, he shall destroy them. He shall bring them down before thy face. So shall you drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said. Speak not thou in thine heart, after the Lord God has cast them out from before thee, saying, For my righteousness, my strength, the Lord has brought me in possession of this land. But for the wickedness of those nations, the Lord drives them out. Not for your righteousness or your uprightness of heart do you go to possess this land, but because of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord thy God will drive them out from before you, that he may perform the word which he swore unto your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Number three, the promise. The promise. And as I, this message came to me, Somewhat, I think it was Thursday or last Sunday when I joked after I, I'm, I'm, I think I might have said purpose, provision, and promise. And those are the PPP loan of God, purpose, provision, and promise. If you remember me saying that. Well, the Lord had that in my heart. And I, I, I said, someday I'm going to preach on that. And then he dropped the message title after the plague and then brought these points back up. Because the points are not the message. The message is that this is what happens after the plague. Now, promise. The promise of God. After the plagues ceased in Egypt, the promise of God that they would be set free took place. The enemy tried to stop them through the army of Egypt. They were stopped. They had a natural boundary to cross, the Red Sea. They crossed. They had a battle on the other side. There was a battle on this side, a battle on the other side. But the battle on the other side, they fought. Battle on this side, God fought. The battle on that side, they fought. They had crossed out of Egypt. There are some battles in our lives that God is going to fight for us. There are other battles he expects us to fight. But the promise is victory. The promise is triumph. And the promise is there is a land that he has selected. It may be a land of a promise of health. It may be a land of a promise of prosperity. It may be a land of a promise of holiness. We're all to be holy, but you know what I mean? Something supernatural, something where you see things and hear things that others don't see or hear, but they're revealed by the Spirit. Whatever that promise is, God has made to you and to me. Whatever that promise is, we may have to fight for it, but he will expect us to fight victoriously, not to give up, not to quit, not to avoid it, but go through it, knowing that God is for us. Who can be against us? God is with us. Who can triumph over us? The promise of God comes after the plagues of the world. The promise of God comes out. Look for the promises of God. There may be promises that you've been believing for for years. There may be promises you've been hoping for for years that you have yet to attain. And yet now, 
The plague is passing. The promises are here. It is time to claim the promises of God, the promises that he has given to each and every one of us, the promises he's given to the church to win the lost, equip the saints, and touch the nations. It's time to do that. It's time for the church to rise up. It's time for the church to shine. The world is in darkness. I don't need to tell you that. The nation is in darkness. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord shall be seen upon us. That light will draw people in as surely as a porch light draws moths by night in the summer. That light will draw people in as surely as a searchlight, a, a lighthouse draws ships in in a storm. That light will draw people in as surely as the city set on the hill can be seen from a distance. It's the light of life. It's the light of love. It's the light of promise. God has promises for others through each one of us. It's not just that we need, want, and desire a promise. It's that others will find their promise through us. Once we realize and recognize we are called, we are anointed, and we are raised up in this time to show forth the light of God, the light of Christ, that light that cannot be hidden by being put under a bed or under a bushel. Let your light shine that all may see your relationship with him. Because after the plague, People are stumbling around in darkness. People are wandering around, wondering what is real, what is not, what is true, what is not. Show the truth of God as a flaming fire. Show the love of God. Show the presence of God. After the plague, purpose, provision, promise. Up till now, we've all been just trying to get our provision, trying to get our needs supplied. Seek the kingdom first and his righteousness. All other things will be added. Trust God. Let's trust God like we've never trusted before. He's doing new things. He's doing new things in our lives, doing new things in the church, doing new things in the, in the world. Let's get ahead of the curve, right? The big word two months, three months ago was flatten the curve, flatten the curve. Now we want to get ahead of the curve. And let's be positioned through the power of God to provide purpose to those who are lost. No one else has what we have. Not just you, believers. No one else can give what we can give. God is counting on us.